Hello everyone, it's time. After all these years, it's finally time to make a video on the terrifying world of animation. Now, if you follow my channel, you probably have figured out by now that I, I kind of like animation. And if you don't follow my channel, you know, you you can do that, you can subscribe. But throughout my time through animation, I've heard many times of people talking about how animation is just for children. And I wanna let you know, if you know someone like that who believes that animation is just for children, send them this video. It's gonna change their mind. Oh, it's gonna. Over time throughout my channel, I have seen a few dark animated films and shows and other things, but I've never really delved down that rabbit hole until now. And let me tell you, this rabbit hole is definitely deep. With this video, I definitely wanted to focus on animated films or maybe animated shorts, but you know, there's gonna be a few maybe YouTube animations in here or just random animations that I found on the internet. And fair warning, uh, obviously, there's gonna be a good amount of gore. There's gonna be a good amount of triggering things, especially when we reach the lower portions of this iceberg. Now, for those who aren't familiar with the iceberg videos, it's the basic concept of the tip of the iceberg. The tip of the iceberg is what everyone knows the further we get down into the depths, that's the shit that is very obscure, a lot of times very depressing and dark. There will be five different tiers. A lot of these came from different icebergs that I saw on the internet, and a lot of these things I actually found myself with my research. Now, before we jump into this hellish landscape of animation, are you guys hungry? Well, what if I told you guys I had something here that could give you a quick meal without having to cook, but at the same time being just as nutritious and delicious as a homemade meal. I'm talking about Factor. Now me personally, I've been using Factor for probably over a year, but Factor is the best solution to never frozen, quick meals that are extremely healthy for you. Maybe you wanna make your gains, maybe you wanna lose weight, or maybe just all around you just wanna eat better, but you don't have the time to always be making those big meals. And on top of everything, they're dietitian approved and you yourself get to choose the meals that you want. And say you have a specific diet, maybe you're on keto, maybe you want like a calorie smart diet, maybe you're vegan, maybe you're vegetarian. And not only healthy meals, they also have healthy snacks. That includes smoothies, juices and other add-ons on top of all that i mentioned it is of course cheaper than takeout factor has completely changed my life and saved me a buttload of time so if you guys are looking for a quick and healthy delicious meal there really is no better way to go about it so head to factor75.com or just click the link in the description and use code bionicpig50 to get 50 percent off your factor box trust me you won't regret it so without further ado let's get into the nitty gritty of it It's a beautiful day. All is calm and peaceful in the meadow. Or is it? If you look closely, very closely. Now starting with tier one, we all know how this goes. This is kind of full of that surface layer, scary, uh, disturbing animations that you've at least heard about once in your life. They're disturbing, sure, but you know, they're passable enough to make it into the public eye. A very talked about and well-known of these is Watership Down, for a good example. Now I'm sure if you've never seen this movie, you've at least heard of this movie. And in the worst case scenario, you saw this movie when you were a child expecting it to be Bambi, and it wasn't. <laughs> The story revolves around a group of rabbits who embark on a perilous journey to find a new home after their warren is threatened by destruction. In the film, a rabbit named Fiverr has a prophetic vision of impending doom that prompts him and his brother Hazel to warn their fellow rabbits about the impending disaster. However, the warren's chief rabbit dismisses their warnings. Fiverr and Hazel decide to gather a group of rabbits willing to follow them in a search of a safer location. And what proceeds in this film is just pure, brutal world of just survival. Survival. It's basically Discovery Channel on steroids. The movie really delves into the complexities of animal behavior and the parallel between rabbit struggles and the human experience. I feel like the reason this movie has become so infamous is the fact that a lot of children, or at least I should say parents, believed it to be a not adult scary movie. I feel like this is one of the first movies that really rang true that, hey, Animation ain't just for little kids anymore. Next, let's talk about YouTube animations. We got David Firth, we got Lee Hardcastle, that entire group of YouTube animators that are very famously known for their horror animation. Firth, I feel, especially gained prominence with his internet animation series, Salad Fingers. That's definitely something that 
pretty much all of us has heard about once or twice. Now, my personal favorite when it comes to David Firth is obviously Cream. Lee Hardcastle might be a little bit more extreme than David Firth when it comes to the gore element. Now, that could just be because the whole stop motion claymation idea, something about claymation truly just makes horror a lot worse. And not only that, but Lee Hardcastle's animations will go on to inspire many people, including someone who we are going to be mentioning later on in this video who's done unspeakable things. Make sure you stick around for tier five to find out who. Obviously we could put Meat Canyon on here and there's plenty of other animators that do this type of horror thing on YouTube. Next we have the classic Happy Tree Friend. Now you know I can't have an animation iceberg without Happy Tree Friends. The one animation that we all saw when we were younger and it scarred us. We shared it around in our little friend groups trying to freak each other out. Oh dude, it's just a little cutesy animated video. Trust me, nothing bad happens. <laughs> But Happy Tree Friends is an animated web series known for its deceptively cute characters who frequently find themselves in incredibly violent and gruesome situations. The juxtaposition of those cutesy, innocent visuals in combination with that extreme violence creates that darkly comedic and shocking graphic tone that we all know and love. Still to this day, people discover this animation for the first time and get fooled by that cutesy nature. And I just want to mention throughout this entire video, that whole juxtaposition of those cute uh, uh innocent idea and then it delves into horror and gore that happens a lot and i don't know why it's always animation that does it but it does it well. And next, I wanted to put the most famous and well-known controversial animated movie of all time. Now, sure, this isn't all animation, but it is semi-animated. Song of the South. Now, the reason this one is so well-known is the fact that it was created by the loving and beautiful Disney itself. This movie is set in the South, obviously, and it follows the story of a young boy named Johnny who visits his grandmother's plantation. There he befriends a man named Uncle Remus, an elderly African-American man who tells him imaginative stories featuring the animated characters Brother Rabbit, Brother Fox, and Brother Bear. The film has been criticized for the portrayal of that racial stereotype and it's glossing over the harsh realities of the time period, you know, slavery. Due to this film, it's actually been withheld from distribution and Disney does everything in its power to make sure that no one can find this movie. Later on, Rolf Bakshi, who is someone we're going to be talking about later on in this video, he released a film called Skin that satirizes these three animated characters. And if you want to know a little bit more about Disney or a little bit more about the movie that I just mentioned, I made videos on both. The Disney iceberg is definitely one of the most deplorable ones I've ever made if you're interested. And I guess with tier one, we can just end on an open note. I feel like anyone and everyone can just throw in the comment section, terrifying and graphic animations that they themselves know. And I'm sure a lot of other people know. I could obviously mention things like Coraline, Paranorman, Nine, other animated movies of that nature. So feel free to leave in the comments of things that you find extremely disturbing that are animated. But it's time to get a little bit deeper, a little bit more obscure. <laughs> Now this animation I actually found on YouTube a while ago, but I honestly think it's one of the coolest animations, at least when it comes to horror character design. The animation is called Playground Trailer, which I hope that means that this is going to turn into an actual show or an actual movie because holy shit, that would be amazing. But in this trailer, there are monsters that are so goddamn cool and absolutely horrific. And it just makes me so curious as to how they work and what they do. And in combination with the soundtrack and how these monsters move, it adds up to an incredible horror experience. And this is just the trailer. But I can gather this is just that basic concept of a cute little playground, one that you would find in, say, a McDonald's. However, once you get inside that playground, it turns into a completely different universe full of different uh, creatures, monsters, uh, alien beings. It's like I said before, the juxtaposition of innocent uh, a children world meets horrific, terrible monsters. Kind of gives you that little nightmares feel with this trailer. Next, we have Cat Soup. Yeah, very interesting name for a movie. Cat Soup is a surreal and abstract animated short film that was released in 2001. The story follows a young cat named Nyata who embarks on a strange and dreamlike journey to retrieve his sister Solon's soul from the land of the dead. Now, this film is known for its unconventional narrative, uh, the visual symbolism, 
and of course the absence of dialogue there's a lot of movies in here that do have absence of dialogue which i really do tend to like in animated movies because it makes people really pay attention to the actual visuals but this movie definitely relies heavily on surrealism and disturbing imagery the main character nyata navigates through a world that blurs the lines between life and death reality and illusion the film explores themes of morality the cyclical nature of existence and the human experience again that combination of innocence and cutesy with terrifying and horror. There are a lot of moments in this movie that definitely make you feel extremely unsettled, uncomfortable, and just weird. It's not like general gore. It's more about the idea of bodies being warped in ways that just don't make natural sense and really leave you with that sense of unease. It really focuses obviously on existentialism, which really leaves you thinking at the end of this short. Next, we have one that is more controversial than disturbing because it has to do with Beavis and Butthead. Yeah. Beavis and Butthead is a show that I'm sure you've probably heard of if you're above the age of 20. It was a raunchy show with two main characters getting into ridiculous situations, and normally they themselves end up being the butt of the joke. Especially when it comes to this episode that was actually banned throughout the world. It went a little bit too far, and it was called Heroes. See, in this episode, we see Beavis and Butthead sitting down watching TV. They see a show with, like, guns, and they're like, damn, guns are cool. And then they see a commercial selling guns and they themselves decide to go to that gun shop and buy a gun and this is where it gets pretty bad they end up accidentally shooting down an entire plane now i'm sure you could already see why this is a banned episode but it actually gets a little bit worse after they shoot down the plane they kind of just look at each other and laugh about it and say wow that was cool you know classic and beavis butthead stuff i mean they do something really really bad and then laugh about it that's kind of just what they do but the thing that really pushed it over the edge is when they were just toying with the people whose lives are on the line inside that plane. A lady asking them to open the door so they can escape, they have two pregnant women, and then they end up looking at each other and laughing again. Later that day at their house, there was a breaking news report about the plane, and it came on blaming everything on the youth of America. They used a picture of Beavis and Butthead, talked about how they mocked everyone on the plane, and then left, and then the end of it was just blaming the youth of America. Now sure, this is just a short 10 minute episode, but me personally, I'm kind of confused on what the joke actually was, or I should say what the message was. At first I thought it was just that idea of how easy it is for someone to just go get a gun, so someone as stupid as Beavis and Butthead can just walk in and buy a gun. But then when it ended with that whole youth thing, I'm not really sure what this episode was trying to display and especially in the time of like terrorism and you know hijacking planes and planes crashing and i don't know it it just was not a good time or was not a good joke at all the episode obviously has been banned but this is again another controversial one not really a disturbing one but still interesting all the same as to why or how they did this it was from a show called tiny toons adventures it was an episode titled one beer now this generated controversy due to its portrayal of alcohol consumption and its potential influence on young viewers now this episode which originally aired in 1991 depicts the main characters who are obviously junior versions of the main Looney Tunes characters, experimenting with drinking beer. The characters engage in reckless behavior and become intoxicated, leading to a series of dangerous and inappropriate actions. Now, the thing I don't get about this is obviously they were trying to show that message of beer is bad, but they went about it in the most unsafe, awful way possible because it was just way too on the nose. They could have talked about peer pressure or they could have talked about a beer but used a different type of drink that wasn't beer you know if that makes sense and at one point they were even meta about the whole situation because at one point bug says to one of his friends that this episode is about the evils of alcohol and then he proceeds to turn into like a devil like horns coming out of his head rubbing his hands together it, like i said a very on the nose 
poorly portrayed way of uh, saying, hey, alcohol is bad, especially since they went on to drink said alcohol and, and be intoxicated. Next, we have a show called Made in Abyss. Now, maybe a lot of you have heard about this show, but I feel like this show is definitely uh, overshadowed and underrated. I remember watching the first season, but the only reason this show is not that popular as it should be is the fact that it keeps bouncing around between different streaming services. And honestly, it's pretty hard to find out where it is half the time. I think originally it was on Shudder, which not many people use, and then it went to Amazon Prime, and then it went to a completely weird streaming service. I completely forget what it's called, but not a normal one. But anyway, this is an anime series. The story is set in a mysterious world where there's a massive chasm called the Abyss, and the Abyss is the subject of exploration and fascination. The Abyss is divided into different sections, each layer as you go down, each with its own unique alien environment, where you learn the rules of each level along with the main character. The more and more you go down, the more and more each level defies the laws of physics. The story follows a character named Rico, a young girl whose mother, a legendary cave raider disappeared into the abyss. One day, Rico discovers a robot boy named Rag, who has who has lost his memory, but he possesses extraordinary power. Determined to learn more about her mother's fate, Rico embarks on a dangerous journey into that abyss with Rag. As they descend deeper and deeper into the abyss's layers, they encounter bizarre creatures, stunning landscapes, and uncover dark secrets hidden within the realm. This series really balances that sense of wonder and that looming sense of danger. The themes in here are about exploration, sacrifice, friendship, and the cost of curiosity. But that's not what really makes this show interesting. On the surface, obviously, you know, it looks campy. Two little kids, one uh, overpowered character going down into these crazy wacky worlds well yeah you're wrong you're wrong this show definitely lulls you into that false sense of security beautiful world beautiful animation and our main characters are children why would anything bad happen, right? But boy, this show does not pull its punches. Once you find out more and more secrets about the abyss and meet people who dive into the abyss, you truly see the deplority of humanity and the things people will do in order to discover the abyss's secrets. You start learning how these monsters came to be. You start understanding their backstory and the absolute disgusting way that they were made. The experiments being done and what truly is down there. It really takes that statement of if you find yourself staring too long into the abyss, you will see the abyss stare back. And boy, does that abyss stare back. It stares back good. I would highly, highly recommend this show. Sure, it gets pretty rough to watch at times, I will admit, but uh, it's a good show. Next, we have another anime. Yes, anime does tend to have some pretty, you know, fucked up things in it. Death Parade. Now, this one I put on here for myself because this is something I watched and I don't really feel like many people have watched this show. And I feel like a lot of what people expect when it comes to disturbing animation or what I'm gonna be talking about on this iceberg is just pure gore, blood, viscera, which don't get me wrong, the more we go down, the more bloody and viscera it gets, but there's a lot more to horror than just gore. Death Parade is just, it's just disturbing. It's a show I saw a while back, but it still sticks with me ever since. It's an anime series that delves into the afterlife Life, exploring those complex themes of morality, judgment, and human nature. The story takes place in a mysterious bar, and it's called the Quindecium. And this is where souls of the deceased arrive to be judged. They're judged whether or not they go into the good place or the bad place. They don't necessarily call it heaven or hell, but that's that basic concept. The bartender, Decium, oversees a unique game that forces these souls to confront their true selves as they make decisions under pressure. There, and don't get me wrong, there is a fair share of gore in this show. But as the souls compete in these games, their memories, their emotions are gradually revealed. You learn their backstories, how they died, why they died, what life they led, leading to profound insights about life in general. 
Desium's assistant Chiyuki is a special case. She came to this world, but she's the only one who's maintained her memories from life. And she kind of sticks around for a while and helps the bartender understand the human experience more deeply. Because in this world, they've done the same thing every single time. They do a game that is very complexly made in order for people to show their true self. But she starts to show that humans aren't that simple. They're a lot more complex than meets the eye. A simple judging of right and wrong is not something that can be done with a simple game. This series focuses on ethical dilemmas faced by souls and their consequences of their decisions. It raises those thought-provoking questions about the nature of humanity. There's moments of forgiveness, redemption, and the concept of life and death. There are so many moments in this show that I had to just take a break after an episode. I had to just take a break and go pace for a while to just think about life. I would recommend if you ever watch this show, make sure that you are in a good mental state because there's a lot of existentialism, a lot of talk about life and death, and it will really mess with you. And regardless of how disturbing this show can get, you are left with kind of a good feeling at the end. Highly recommend this show. Next, we have Persepolis. Now this one is controversial because it has a lot to do with politics, as this displays the harsh true story of the Iranian government. Persepolis is an animated film adaptation of a graphic novel of the same name, and it tells the autobiographical story of the author's upbringing in Iran during and after the Islamic Revolution. This film portrays her experiences growing up under a repressive regime, her family's struggles, her curiosity about the world, and her eventual journey to Europe to escape the political turmoil in her homeland. Now, I feel like this film really just puts life into perspective and how lucky some of us truly are, because sometimes we do tend to take life for granted where we live. And seeing something like this really puts that in perspective. It portrays her inner conflicts as she grapples with a revolving identity amidst a changing society. In this, there's so much brutal misogyny in this, but at the same time, that is just their world. To some people, this movie can be really tough to watch, to see the sexist nature of a world that she was living in. But again, I feel like the most disturbing movies always tend to be the ones that show humans for who they truly are, or show the world how things truly are. Because the reason they are so terrifying is the fact that they are real. I'm actually planning on delving into this movie a little bit more into the future for a full-fledged video. If you're interested, make sure to subscribe. Now, let's move on into tier three. Satoshi Khan's name has definitely been used to describe disturbing animations. He's created movies such as Perfect Blue and Paprika, but he's also created a show that is just plain mindfuck, which I mean, that's just Satoshi Khan. That's the type of stuff he makes. Paranoia Agent is an anime series directed by Satoshi Khan that delves into the psychological and surreal themes. The story revolves around a series of mysterious assaults carried out by a mysterious rollerblading boy named Shonen Bat, or Little Slugger in the English version. As detectives investigate the seemingly unrelated attacks, they uncover a complex web of interconnected characters, each struggling with their own personal issues and demons. This series talks about various psychological phenomena, including the collective delusion or the disassociation. I feel like that's something that a lot of us have dealt with or heard of, and it blurs reality and imagination throughout. And as the story unfolds, it becomes increasingly difficult to discern what's real and what's fake. And that is all the product of these characters' troubled minds. Something about mental illness and thrillers like this always hit me really hard because of the fact that these issues are real. These are things that people do deal with. That concept of disassociation and blurring the lines between reality and fiction, some people live that life where they don't know what's real and what's fake. And I feel like Satoshi Khan loves this idea, the idea of blurring that, because people who have these mental issues aren't talked about enough or aren't really thought about in this way. So showing it in this fashion really cuts deep. Next, we have Animal Farm. Now, Animal Farm is a novel written by George Orwell and is published in 1945. And the story is just a satirical allegory that uses a group of farm animals as representation as events leading up to and following the Russian Revolution of 1917 and the subsequent Stalinist era in the Soviet Union. Now, after I said that, you're thinking, ah, oh, yeah, this is this for adults, right? No. This is a PG movie, and it was meant for children. The animals on the manor farm led by the pigs rise up against their human owner, Mr. Jones, 
and established their own society based on the principle of all animals are equal. The two leaders named Snowball and Napoleon promise a utopian life for all animals on the farm. However, over time, the pigs begin to betray their principles, consolidate power, and transform the farm into a dictatorship where they become indistinguishable from the human oppressors that initially rebelled against. Welcome to the animal farm, where all animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. This movie was extremely controversial, which, I mean, for obvious reasons, it's very upset. The fact that they pushed this movie for children. I mean, regardless of your political views, shoving any politics down your children's throat is absolutely horrific, which happens constantly, especially in today's world. I mean, I don't know, the exploration of how idealistic revolutions can devolve into an authoritarianism and betrayal of the original ideas. I mean, I don't know, I don't think that's something a child would be wanting to watch. And not to mention, this movie is very violent. <laughs> there are many deaths in the movie and these deaths are quite brutal, especially for a movie rated PG. There's even moments in this movie referencing Russian authoritarianism and even Hitler. But this is not me taking any political stance or anything. This is just me saying, I think putting politics on a child isn't good. Next, let's talk about Fantastic Planet. But this is set on a different planet called Yam. The movie portrays a world where humans, known as Ohms, are treated as pets or pests by the dominant race, the giant blue aliens called Drag. The film follows the journey of a human Ohm named Tur, who becomes a symbol of resistance against the Drag's oppression. Tur encounters a group of wild Ohms who seek freedom and equality. Together they embark on a quest to challenge the drag's rule and fight for the Ohms' right to live freely. The reason I picked this movie is many reasons. I mean, it's just unsettling seeing humans being domesticated like cute little animals in a world where the laws we know just make no sense. And by that, I mean everything is very psychedelic looking in this movie. The laws of physics just don't make sense. I mean, the animation of the 70s to 90s was honestly some of the coolest shit because a lot of it is very trippy. But there are thought-provoking moments in this movie. It tackles subjects like racism, oppression, and the abuse of power. I would consider this movie an art piece, especially with the unique animation style of using cutouts. It really makes for a unique and very unsettling experience. Next, we have Wolf House. It tells the fictional story of a young woman who ventures into an abandoned house in the woods with her friends. They hope to document their experiences for an art project, but as they spend more time in the house, they become trapped in a nightmarish world where reality distorts and monstrous forces begin to threaten them. This film uses that found footage feeling and the animation techniques to create a dark, surreal experience. Again, it's one of those movies that blur reality and the supernatural. I feel like where this movie thrives is the animation itself. Not only is it stop motion, which I would just like to mention, stop motion is definitely one of the most terrifying types of animation there is, but the way that they use the stop motion, the way that they use wall as a canvas and how they bleed into each other and things come out of the wall and, and things go into the wall and so many different art forms and styles into one. Not just the animation, but the production itself was very unorthodox. It was animated in a self-contained movable workspace, improvising the entire way. They didn't even storyboard. They just had a 10 commandment rule of things in order to just keep things a little bit tight. But Leon said, we had a script from the beginning, but that script kept changing always. During the five years of production, we never respected the script. Apparently, they moved their studio 12 times. People from around the area actually just came in and offered their hand to help. But the product that came out is some of the most horrific, unsettling stuff I've seen in a stop motion movie. I highly recommend checking this one out. Devil Man Cry Baby. Now, you know, I can't make a freaking disturbing animated now, you know I can't make a disturbing animation list without at least mentioning Devil Man Cry Baby at least once. This show is visually stunning and emotionally intense. This series dives into deep themes of morality, identity, and the duality of human nature. And I feel like above all, it's more of like a character study of the main character. The animation style is very distinct and, and dynamic. It blends that traditional hand-drawn animation with the unique and fluid visual approach that does complement the dark and chaotic nature of the show itself. Some people don't like the animation because of the weird way it looks at times, which I completely understand. I mean, I'm sure some people have probably seen the scene of them running. It, it doesn't look normal. 
No, doesn't look normal at all. Our main protagonist, Akira, becomes a devil man after merging with the demon. And Akira himself is known to be kind of a crybaby, you know, a devil man crybaby. But he's kind of bullied throughout, kind of laughed at, treated like, a, you know, a nerd. He's very compassionate, and above all, he's kind of a coward. So that juxtaposition of pure evil chaos combining with cowardice and crybaby makes for a very interesting uh, character. And throughout the show, you get to see how this demon influences him to become more than just his weakness. The series does not shy away from depicting graphic violence. There are moments in this movie that are just truly shocking. One specific scene, minor spoilers here, that really, really fucked with me. I don't know why it was this one of all that fucked with me, but it did. But I did have to take a break after watching this part. So in the movie, different people start becoming possessed by demons. And one child becomes possessed by a demon, right? And what do demons crave? They crave human flesh, and they cannot survive without human flesh. And his mother, fearing for him being discovered, because in this part of the movie, if they're discovered, they're 100% gonna get killed. But the mom ends up letting her son eat her. And while he's in the process of eating her, the father walks in on it happening while you see a tear come from the child's face and the dad starts screaming. God, dude, that scene just still to this day gives me chills. It's so messed up. But I feel like this show explores that concept of mob mentality and especially the fear of the unknown and how crazy people can become when they don't understand something. Because as the story unfolds, it really becomes a heartbreaking exploration of the consequences of intolerance and the tragedy of misunderstanding. And I feel like misunderstanding and ignorance is a huge part of this. It kind of shows the extreme of the extreme when it comes to ignorance. Because something that is as simple as just reaching out and trying to understand something is seemingly impossible for the populace. And also the soundtrack. Yeah, the soundtrack slaps. I still find myself listening to some of the tracks here and there. It, it slaps. While the show is extremely graphic, it is a fantastic story and it explores a lot of heavy topics. I would highly recommend this for you guys, but it, it, it it's tough. <laughs> it's... It's tough to get through. Next, we have an animated short on YouTube that was released in 2022, pretty recent. And I'm honestly surprised this short doesn't get more credit. There are a lot of messed up shorts on the platform. And for SA victims, I would like to mention this might be semi-triggering. The reason this short is so depressing is the fact that it has to do with child SA and just abuse in general. But they used a grim fairy tale as kind of a basis for the story. At the beginning of the video, we see a mom pulling out baby goats from the stomach of a wolf. She looks for the last child and she discovers that that child is beyond saving. We then cut to her taking a child back to her home against this child's will, it seems like. We do not know the child's name because she refers to him as her son who passed, Toraku. We meet the children of the sheep and a couple of them have brutal scars on them. They all start to question whether or not he is the real Toraku. And at this point, I start to wonder, is the mom just delusional or something like that? But it kind of takes a turn that is really interesting. As Toroku tries to escape the little house, they hear the sound of what seems to be a wolf. So they all end up hiding in very creative ways, mind you. But what they thought was a wolf turned out to be the boy's real father. And this is where it gets depressing. The father starts caressing the boy. And this is where we start seeing why the mother ended up taking the child. Once the boy finally tells his father no, he turns into a wolf and becomes very, very aggressive. Or at least that's how the sheep and the child see him. They see him as a wolf, as a monster. So they all end up attacking the father and the mother sheep comes in at the last second and tases him, saving the little boy. And in the end, we see her cutting open another stomach and putting rocks in it. And at the end of this little short, she walks away from her home. We see a shoe float on the water next to their home. So we could pretty much surmise that she cut open the stomach of the dad, put rocks in him and made him drown. This one isn't necessarily disturbing in the way that we would normally think. I feel like this one really is just the triggering element, you know, of SA. This story does have a happy ending where the boy gets to live with his new family as the father is now dead. Played the father turning into a wolf and how people who do these things truly are disgusting monsters 
It really deserves more praise and credit. I highly recommend uh, viewing this short. Next, we have a movie that's disturbing and controversial, and you might have heard of this. It's kind of the darker, more depressing sister to Watership Down. Now, I don't know about you guys, but something about animals getting hurt and brutally killed in movies always tend to hit harder than humans getting hurt. I don't know if that's just because it's more of a rarity in movies, but seeing an animal being experimented on and basically tortured really rings a different bell in my disturbed brain. Plague Dogs is an animated film released in 1982, directed by Martin Rosen and based on the novel by Richard Adams. The Plague Dog follows these two dogs as they break out of a research facility and try to live life as wild animals. Meanwhile, the facility is doing everything in their power to track down these dogs because they possibly might have the bubonic plague. Ralph has no faith in humanity, having never had a loving home before and being taken down to the facility. But Snitter hopes that the two will find a good home and continues to preach about how nice humans can be in the world. Upon the release of this movie on VHS, acquiring the complete 103 minute version was not possible. There was an edited version that was lasting 83 minutes, but this omitted various scenes to reduce the overall duration. With a notable exclusion, being the most shocking segment in the narrative. In this portion, a gunman named Aklad is tasked with locating and shooting these dogs. However, he meets his demise by plummeting from a rocky cliff instead. And this is the kicker. Starving and desperate during the winter, the dogs stumble upon his lifeless body. The movie then transitions to a scene involving a military helicopter utilizing a spotlight to search for the animals. It discovers Akalad's now mutilated remains, confirming that the dogs had in fact consumed the dead corpse. This movie is not for everyone. That's, you know, to say the least. It'll make you feel nauseous at times, but the messages about experimenting on animals and how terrible that can look, it makes sense that this movie was so horrific. Again, the most horrific and disturbing movies in the world just put up a mirror to society. <laughs> now, you all have heard of Alice in Wonderland, but I'm sure you haven't heard of the delicious Malice in Wonderland, right? The surreal animated mess is a short made by Vince Collins. It's loosely based on Alice in Wonderland, but uh, let me just read you the plot synopsis and then, and then you tell me. You tell me. A jet-propelled white rabbit flies through the vulva of a supine woman into a wonderland where people and objects turn inside out, changing shapes and identities at warp speed. And to say this movie follows the same story as Alice in Wonderland, yeah, that that's a bit of a stretch. But the reason this is on the list is watching this animation is probably one of the most unsettling things. It's not really gore, necessarily, but displaying bodies turning inside out and just how it's shown in the background noise, there's moments of just screams. It's so uncomfortable to watch. I feel like the fact that it just makes no sense really just eats at you. All right, now we're moving on to the really, really tough stuff. We're moving on to tier four. <laughs> that stuff before, yeah, that stuff was baby stuff. Right, that's for babies. Mad God. Now, if you watch my channel, which if you don't watch my channel, you should subscribe right now. I actually made a video on this movie and it is called Mad God and it is a stop motion silent nightmare. This movie is based on the concept of the Tower of Babylon, the myth of the tower that the Babylonians built in order to reach the heavens. Now in the Bible, the story goes that, you know, God made it to where the tower would never be finished by confusing their languages. However, this movie talks about the idea of what would happen if you did finish the Tower of Babylon and how God would punish everyone. And boy, the product is some of the most horrific stuff I've ever seen. Like stuff you can't even imagine in your deepest nightmare. Now this is set in a dystopian otherworldly landscape. It follows a protagonist navigating through a nightmarish realm filled with bizarre, grotesque creatures, surreal landscapes, and disturbing imagery. The film's narrative is deliberately abstract and non-linear. It doesn't really go any which direction. It does have a, a main concept. The ending does have somewhat of a conclusion, but that's what I love about this movie. You get to sit back and just focus on the visuals. There's no dialogue to distract you from anything. You get to pay attention to what's going on. Sure, you might throw up. You might get nauseous watching this, 
but it's cool. There's some moments in this movie where even I caught myself looking away. I feel like one particular moment had to be uh, the doctors doing surgery. It was just, it's just pure gore. Like it just gory. I, and I don't really do good with gore. And if you want to delve deeper into how disgusting and deplorable this movie truly is, I highly, highly recommend that you check out my video because I go throughout the entire thing every little minute detail of this movie. And it is as crazy as it looks. I talk about the symbolism and the reason behind the horrific world. It's such a good movie and I highly recommend that you check out my video about it. Next, we have the Higurashi series. And this is something that I've heard about here and there, but I've never really delved into. I've seen a few memes about it, but never understood what it was about. But boy, is this, it, but boy, is this definitely one of the most uh, gut-wrenching anime I've seen. Based on the visual novel, it revolves around a small rural village and the horrible events that unfold there. One of the reasons this show is horrific is the fact that it doesn't start that way. The village is seemingly completely normal and almost idealistic. You would never expect something actually bad happening here. But there's still that constant sense of something being off and there definitely is. It presents variations of the same events, allowing viewers to witness different perspectives of that said event. If violence and gore appeals to your taste, you're likely to find this show enjoyable. Watching this series through to the end might require a little bit of determination and a little bit of patience. It is a very challenging viewing experience. It is intriguing at, at times, but each installment becomes increasingly draining and melancholic and just painful. The characters continually try to avoid these gruesome fates, often without success creating a reoccurring cycle of pain. It's clear that this series is just a series to be like, damn, that's gross. That creeps me out. I will admit one thing about this show that kind of can take you out of it. The animation's not really that good at times. And I feel like this show is more about shock factor than anything else. It's literally shock factor the anime. I feel like what makes these scenes so brutal tends to be the maniacal laughter that comes with it. One scene in particular that really messed with me because it had to do with kind of suicide. Character escapes torture by planting a knife against the wall and just bashing her head against it. Yeah, definitely not something you would like to show your kiddos. Uh -uh. Not at all. And yet another film that has to do with animals. Something about animals and horror really hit different. Fella Day is a film that delves into the horrors of the feline world. It's a murder mystery, but the twist has to do with cats. <laughs> the film follows a curious and intelligent cat named Francis as he moves to a new neighborhood and becomes entangled in a series of brutal and gruesome killings. As he investigates, he goes into a world of secrets, conspiracies, and feline society. A lot of this, just like a lot of these animal movies, mirror that of human nature and just human complexities. And just like Plague Dogs, this movie talks about animal experimentation and a societal hierarchy, and it gets extremely graphic. There is a lot of violence and unsettling imagery, and let me just list a few of them. Cat corpses are seen with their throats ripped out. A female cat's body is seen completely ripped apart. And the main character has a dream where he is chained up and whipped around and he hits his head on the ceiling and blood splatters everywhere. Dead bodies being played with like puppets. One part I would say is the most graphic is when a female cat was discovered with her throat ripped out, her stomach ripped open and dead baby kitten fetuses. We're just hanging out. Bleh. 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 Ew. Next, I wanted to talk about Junji Ito. Now, sure, Junji Ito isn't known for his animations. However, there are the Junji Ito collections, which are kind of notoriously not that great. And it's just not really living up to the source material. However, the manga Uzumaki, which is one of Junji Ito's most popular series, is going to get animated. And it honestly looks really freaking cool from the teasers and is coming out later this year. And Uzumaki was probably the first time I was ever exposed to the horrors of Junji Ito. He is a master of very, very unique horror. It's hard to explain unless you read it. He can take something so simple and make it a horror masterpiece. For example, I can no longer look at a spiral the same again. After reading Uzumaki, I don't think anyone can look at a spiral the same. But Junji Ito's stories normally revolve around the unknown and cosmic horror. It's very surreal and I feel like the reason it really eats at you is it is very out there, right? Like a lot of it doesn't make sense, but it kind of is grounded 
where it has a message that makes it feel real, if that makes sense. One of my favorites, and the one that really messed with me for a while, is called the Enigma of Amagara Fault. A strange phenomenon happens where holes are appearing in this random rock wall, and all of these holes seem to be human-shaped. Some people from all around the world come to see this enigma only to get enticed to come closer. Some people end up discovering that these holes are perfectly shaped just for them. And because of that fact, these people are overcome by curiosity and entranced to go inside of this hole. But once they get in, they can't get out. The only thing they can do is move forward. And as they move forward, they soon realize that these holes distort. They change. They move. And what you find at the other side of this hole is something out of your nightmares. Next, let's talk about the most controversial animated director to ever exist, Rolf Bakshi. Rolf Bakshi is really notorious for his controversy when it comes to animation. I recently made a video about one of his titles, and I just want to mention I would honestly remake that video after researching Rolf Bakshi a little bit more. I feel like I was a little bit too hard on Rolf Bakshi, not gonna lie. Because the more you watch his animations and the more you analyze and look at the nuance, you realize how brilliant he actually is. These movies are all extremely shocking. Wizards, Coonskin, Heavy Traffic, and more famously known out of all of them, Fritz the Cat. All of these movies display terrible things. Racism, sexism, political jargon, and loads and loads of violence. But once you view these movies in a different lens and look beyond the surface layer, you start to realize all of these movies were meant to shock people in order for them to truly listen to the message. Like I said before, putting up a mirror to society. Messages about marginalized people, about capitalism, police brutality, crime, and so many more. I will admit to most people, these movies will be very hard to stomach. There is extreme racist caricatures. There's a lot of stereotypes. But I feel like if you look past it, look at the nuance, and see what the actual point of him doing this is, you'll start to appreciate these movies for what they are. But the reason Bakshi is so far down on this, but the reason Bakshi is down here on this list is because he is extremely controversial. He's caused court cases. He's caused riots. He's caused countless protests. People throwing smoke bombs into theaters in order to protest the movie. He truly has mastered that art of getting people to talk because boy, do these movies get people to talk. But the problem is the fact that the world is not really a place that looks at nuance. I would say 70% and hell, 90% of people don't look at nuance. They see something on the surface. They look at the cover, but they don't look beyond it. They, they see what's there, judge it for what it is, and don't look beyond. And I feel like that in of itself shows the true problem with humans in general and just society. And I feel like that was another reason why Bakshi went that route, to show everyone that most people don't look at nuance and most people don't take time to understand. Miscommunication, misunderstanding, ignorance, those things are what cause most of the problems in our society today. The next movie we're gonna be talking about is called Belladonna of Sadness, a very abstract movie depicting scenes of sexual violence, misogyny, and just the history of violence with women, Jean. The story follows a young woman named Jean who lives in a medieval village. Jean and her husband, Jean, are about to be married, but their happiness is short-lived when the local baron takes advantage of his feudal rights and forces himself on Jean during their wedding night. This traumatic experience leads Jean to embrace witchcraft as a means of empowerment and revenge. As Jean becomes more involved in witchcraft, she gains supernatural abilities and becomes a figure of both fascination and fear in the village. She ends up joining forces with a demon named the Devil, and they embark on a journey of self-discovery, sexual liberation, and a rebellion against the oppressive societal norm. A lot of the surreal and hallucinatory moments in this movie are showing Jean's emotional and psychological state. The visuals are very abstract and symbolic. I feel like the visuals themselves aren't the thing that really makes this film so disturbing, but the story that is being told, the things that are happening, all of the horrific things that happen in the movie are shown in a very abstract way, but knowing what's going on, it, it's really depressing and disturbing because once again, it's real. Like all of these things that happen are real. Next, we have a more recent YouTube animation and 
And this is actually something I discovered from you guys. It was highly recommended when I asked on the community tab what I should talk about and why. This is a cautionary tale on children and how easily they can be manipulated and lured into their death. It gives off the creepy found footage VHS vibe, but the concept of the short is pretty simple but that in of itself is what makes it terrifying. You know, it starts out like a simple children's show, which we've all seen this trope when it comes to horror. A boy named Caleb was gifted a camera on his birthday, but he accidentally tripped and broke his camera. So lying in his bed in the middle of the night, a sleep fairy comes to visit him and tells him that he can fix his camera. So he tells the kid to follow him into a portal to a different dimension in order for him to fix that camera for him. But we start to see that this portal is just an old abandoned house and the truth starts to really sink in. All the while, Caleb is taking pictures of the house, inside the house, around the house, but that voice keeps calling for Caleb until he reaches a set of stairs that leads to the basement. And goddamn, this part just gives me chills. So the pictures that Caleb is taking they look like they're real life. The short is animated, but every time he takes a picture, it looks like a real life picture. Whenever he takes a picture down the stairs, you see this cute little uh, sleep fairy, but it's not a cute little sleep fairy. It's a man in a costume. He continues down the stairs where it gets darker and darker to the point he can't see anything. And the last picture we see is the bottom half of a grown man. And then we get one more image, the last image. It's a picture of the boy, or should I say what's left of him. The narrator ends this short by saying the rest of the boy was never found. The reason this one is so haunting is again, the fact that this is something that happens all the time. And also I am a father and sure, I some people might consider me to be overprotective of my child, but things like this are always the reason why I am always keeping an eye on my son no matter what. Children getting convinced by an adult to follow them using tactics like maybe a costume, portraying an innocent adult, telling him that they're gonna help him with something, making it seem like they really aren't as much of a stranger as they think they are is just so chilling the disgusting things that these people do in order to entice children all right it's been a pretty rough ride on this horrific roller coaster but we're not done we got the last stage we got tier five and if you guys thought that the stuff before was rough it's gonna give you a fair warning before we go further it gets a lot worse Now this one is another one I previously made a video on. Dolly Flesh was a YouTuber who created horrific stop motion animations with clay. He was heavily inspired by people like Lee Hardcastle. He seemed to be a very, very troubled individual early on in life. He had an obsession with gore and horror, but the problem with it was the fact that it was a very sexual obsession with it. And some of the claymation things that he made is definitely one of the harshest things that I've ever seen when it comes to claymation. If you would like to see it uncensored, you can always go over to my Patreon where this entire video is going to be uncensored. But this is depicting extremely sexual, grotesque scenes that after understanding the individual a little bit more, it becomes even more horrific. Guy has a lot of talent for this stuff. However, that is not why he is on the list. It's not because this horrific claymations, it's not because of how gory they look, because of something he did in the future. Because this animator ends up turning into a monster. Later on in his YouTube career, he posted a video of him eating spaghetti from a dead clay baby. Not sure, you probably see this. I think it's a cute, little, funny, uh, dark humor joke. Oh, it, it's funny, he's implying that he's eating the organs of a dead baby. And there was another video of him milking clay boobies, which I still to this day have never understood why, but that's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about what comes next. The next video he posted truly left everyone stunned. He posted a video with him and three hamsters. A seemingly harmless video, he bought some hamsters from PetSmart or Petco or whatever, brought it home to show everyone his cute little, cute little animal. But no, in this video, Dolly Flesh will proceed to torture these poor hamsters, killing every single one of them, smashing them, punching them, putting them in a microwave, and so on. If you want to know the whole story of Dolly Flesh, his history, how he came to be, the stuff that he made, why he did what he did, I highly recommend that you check out my video on my channel because I do a deep dive on him as a person. And let me tell you, it is... Uh, 
extremely, extremely disturbing. This next one has to do with World War II. A movie was made to show the difficulties and horror of a world after the atomic bombing of Hiroshima. At its core, Barefoot Jen follows the experiences of a young boy named Jen and his family in the aftermath of the atomic bomb. The film does capture the horror of the bombing with loads of realism showing the devastation, the physical toll on survivors, and the heartbreaking loss of life. Through Jen's eyes, viewers witness the struggle to find food, to find shelter, and, and the ability to try to find hope amidst just pure ruin. Jen and the others in the community demonstrate remarkable strength, compassion, and their will to rebuild their lives. I feel like the movie does have a little bit of a positive message throughout showing the power and the solidarity of human spirit, even in the darkest times. But just witnessing this and thinking about the horrors of the world and how real it actually was, it, it really just leaves a pit in your stomach. And what really pushes this movie over the edge is when they show the bombing of Hiroshima, because they do, they animate that. And it is some of the most nauseating stuff I've ever seen. And I'm not gonna lie, I honestly feel like it's important to see, I mean, obviously if, if you're an adult, but seeing a little girl just holding a balloon, just playing, minding her own business, loving her life, all of a sudden her flesh starts melting, eyeballs melting out of her skull. She turns into, she turns she basically becomes mummified instantly. People walking around like zombies with their flesh melting off of them, seeing mummified mothers holding their children, the aftermath of the radiation and just the hellscape of it all. In this depiction, it really looks like something out of a fantasy, a dystopian future, but no, this is real, an actual apocalypse, hell rising to the surface. This is the harsh reality of war and nuclear fallout. I feel like, th I feel like this is uh, good because it shows the power of the human spirit, showing how even in the most hellish, dire times of life, humans will find a way to adapt and push through it. Kind of reminds me of the book, Man Searching for Meaning. And in, in this book, it's a real depiction of a man who survives the Holocaust and how he was able to keep his spirits up, even in the most dire time. It really shows the ability for mankind to adapt to pretty much anything, even the most harshest, disgusting, awful situation. Now, next we have another anime, and this one was released in 1984, and on the surface, you know, just looks like run-of-the-mill anime, nothing gory, nothing scary, but once you understand the reason behind its creation, and the underlying messages intertwined within this show, you'll understand why it's actually extremely horrific. See, this anime is actually a recruitment tactic by a death cult known as Om. And this, and this death cult was known throughout Japan as one of the most deadly cults ever. And this very cult led a huge act of terrorism by chemical warfare. This cult religious group was an eclectic mix of Buddhist, Hindu, Taoist, and Christian belief. Alms official recognition as a religious organization qualified it to pursue its activities without any oversight from the Japanese government. Cult leaders' efforts to control followers intensified and expanded to efforts to gain political control of the entire country through election. However, whenever that didn't work out, in 1993, they began to create chemical weapons as a response. This involved an estimated $30 million and employed many scientists and skilled workers. One of Om's earliest attacks with the toxic substance was the use of a truck equipped with a device to spray chemicals in the area of the Japanese parliament. The attack was intended to destroy Japan's government by killing as many leaders as possible. And although the equipment did work, the toxin failed. That wasn't the only attempt. There were plenty of other attempts and a lot of them ended up failing. However, there was one successful attack aimed at three judges involving a case with all. And this was followed by a sarin attack on the Tokyo subway on March 20th, 1995. Many Om fall followers, including most of the cult leaders, have been tried and convicted of various crimes related to the cult's violent and illegal activities after killing so many people and injuring that many more. This has probably been one of the most terrifying cults, at least from my knowledge when it comes to size. Thinking about the fact that this cult's main goal was completely overtaking the government and they actually almost did is just crazy. And there are so many instances of them being completely overlooked by the government and police because they had so many different connections. 
Strike. There are a lot of videos out there about this cult if you want to learn more about it because it is really interesting just thinking about how they were able to just claw their way up and get so many different followers and even get the funds to create an entire anime in the sole idea of trying to recruit children into their cult. It's disgusting. Now this next one is really disturbing and really controversial. It's actually banned everywhere. It's called Shoujo Tsubaki, or better known as Midori the Camellia Girl. Now this was released in 1992 and the movie is known for its extreme shock fact. The film follows the story of Midori, a 14 year old girl. You could already kind of see where the problems are starting, but she becomes entangled in a bizarre and nightmarish circus run by the enigmatic Mr. Ariashi. Midori's life takes a tragic turn. She ends up facing exploitation, abuse, and degradation within the confines of this freak show. The film delves into the dark themes of humanity and how cruel humans can truly be. This depressing tale opens with Midori selling flowers and on the roadside in order to help her sick mother. While there, there was a creepy individual that approaches her and offers her shelter in the event that she should find herself in need of it. Midori returns home to find her mother dead and being eaten by rats. Oh God. So out of desperation, she ends up joining the circus in order to find somewhere to go to find shelter. However, the people there proceeded to not only emotionally, but physically torment her. One scene that really lived in infamy was when Midori was witnessing the brutal slaughter of a bunch of puppies. And then it just keeps getting worse. The killer then proceeds to rear Midori. And I know you're thinking, oh, come on, like that's it, right? No. No, some of the circus freaks start eating the dead puppies. <laughs> Jesus Christ. There's also another extremely grotesque scene of the dwarf magician who has a mental breakdown because someone ends up calling him short. So in a blind rage, he uses his power to completely mutilate, disembowel, and burn his audience. The animation used in this is that classic 90s style anime, you know, very psychedelic all over the place, but it's not bad by any means. It's gross, but it's not bad. And to say the least, yeah, this movie doesn't really have a happy ending. The film's unique approach and willingness to confront this taboo stuff has really garnered a cult classic following. However, at the same time, it has garnered a lot of harsh critiques which rightfully so. It's often regarded as a cult classic because of the fact of the extreme shock factor and showing the world that unapologetic view of how humans can truly be. And last but not least, we have Picadon. Now this one is again about World War II and the Hiroshima bombing. This is actually something I myself stumbled upon on YouTube by complete accident, having no idea what I'm getting myself into and boy, wasn't an experience. Barefoot Gen had some extremely graphic animation when it came to the bombing. But the reason Picadon is so important is the fact that it was the first time anyone has actually tried to tackle the Hiroshima bombing within an animated media. And this animated short had some huge impact on the people of Hiroshima. They actually decided to establish the Hiroshima International Animation Festival in 1984 in honor of this animation. And something interesting about the title is Picadon actually is referring to the nuclear bomb itself. Pika or flash stands for the instant flash of the bomb and how, you know, people just instantly got vaporized and Dawn or Boom stands for the enormous shock wave that went after. And I know all of you are wondering, what is in this short? Well, I mean, like Hiroshima, <laughs> the, the atomic bombing, that, that's what it is. And I feel like this one has so much uh, historical value and so much importance in the world because this was the first time anyone's dared to show everyone on the outside how horrible it truly was. Because let's be real, everyone else didn't have to view it. They didn't really think about how terrible it truly is. And what made it extra depressing is just showing the innocence of everyone before the bombing happened. People just living their lives, a father playing with his child, a student just playing around at school, people taking family photos, a child throwing a paper airplane that he spent time making, people working, people mingling, just as humans do every single day. And then boom, it cuts to the bomb, flesh, melting off of people's bodies, bodies lying in the street, combining into a mound of melted flesh. The sound of screams heard every direction, children being turned into just bones and being mummified. So horrific witnessing this in an animated form because I feel like the only way to properly show how horrific it was is 
in animated form because of how batshit crazy this stuff is, like melting flesh. But it is the true reality of this horrific event. And, and it has gone down to be one of the most important representations of the Hiroshima bombing and truly showing everyone in the world how awful it can be. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. That is the most uh, painful experience of a video I've ever had to go through. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. And if you did, please make sure to subscribe. Please make sure to like and turn on your notifications. Share this with a friend, especially someone who believes that animation is for children because I'm sure you could see by now, this is gonna change their mind. Well, thank you everyone for watching. I know this was a rough one, but hey, I hope you have a good day.